I'd like to welcome our final speaker um, of the day, um, who is Neil Hall. Um, I'm not going to go through all the initials, but he's, the, he's a retired assistant commissioner and is an independent maritime law enforcement and security advisor. Thank you very much, Neil. As I've uh, just been introduced, my name is uh, Neil Hall. Um, if you look at the backdrop here, hopefully you can see Limassol Port in the background there. And that is in fact me actually driving the boat there. <clears throat> so what I want to actually do uh, is talk to you very briefly about maritime security and especially how it relates to Cyprus. Now, this is not something I can do in 12 minutes, so there's going to be some real fast bullet points here. But uh, as the other presenters have said, I'm happy to discuss it uh, afterwards. Um, also, some of the stuff, the, this is the joy of going last, some of the stuff that I was going to talk about has already been mentioned, so we'll be able to move through a little bit quicker. So what actually gives me the right to talk about uh, uh, maritime security in Cyprus? Well, in 2001, I went to Cyprus, the sovereign base areas, as the senior Royal Navy officer and commanding officer of what was then the Cyprus Royal Navy Squadron. While I was there, it became very apparent to me that there was a big gap in law enforcement uh, on, the, on the waters around the sovereign base areas. And so I sold my soul, and with the seamless transition, I went from naval officer to police officer. And that picture is there is me in the uniform of the sovereign base areas police, taken in Episcopi. So, for about eight years of my life, I was very, very involved in maritime security in the island of Cyprus. I'm still very connected with Cyprus. Um, I own a house in Ipsmus, and in fact my wife is there at the moment. She tells me the weather's lovely in Cyprus. Okay, so the aim of this presentation, to look at the key concerns, I think, that uh, affect maritime security in Cyprus. I don't intend to read everything out. You're all quite capable of uh, reading the slides for yourself. If I'm going too fast, please ask me to slow down. Okay, some salient facts about uh, maritime in Cyprus, and I think most of you will probably be fully aware of all of these. That is a big coastline to look after. We talked about the, uh, the territorial waters and the economic exclusion zone, you already know that. But what is interesting there, nowhere in Cyprus is more than 30 miles from the sea. I know, because I did the research on this, and I've got a tape measure out and put it on the map. So wherever you are in Cyprus, it's not going to take you long to get to the water. And Cyprus has this maritime tradition, which we're all aware of, still very important now. There are a huge amount of shipping companies who are actually based in Cyprus at the moment. And they want, they want to develop and they want things to work for them. And we've spoken also about the marinas uh, and the diving industry and the cruise line industry. I'll come on to a little bit more about that later. But Cyprus is three communities, which we're all aware of. We have the Republic of Cyprus, which uh, is in the south. We have the so-called Turkish uh, TRNC, which, whether we like it or not, it does actually exist. The fact that it's not recognized by anyone other than, I think, North Korea is neither here nor there, but it does exist. And of course, we have the British sovereign base areas, which, um, having Having been there for about eight years of my life, probably makes me a neo-colonialist, but uh, I'm sure you'll excuse me for that. So we have the three distinct communities, all in Cyprus. Now I'm glad to say that when I went there in 2001, they were a bit separate, but by the time I left uh, a good eight years later, things had definitely improved, and there was much more engagement between all three of the communities in all sorts of areas. And that's certainly true in the maritime arena. Um, I did a lot of work when I was there with the Royal Navy to engage with the Republic of Cyprus Coast Guard and we actually got some good stuff going between us. And then when I became a police officer and I was in command of the Sovereign Base Area's uh, Police Marine Unit, I did a lot of work with the uh, Astinomia and their Maritime Division to get more engagement. And by the time I left, we were all working together quite happily. So that engagement is there, but we must never forget that Currently, Cyprus is an island of three separate communities. Okay, piracy is the hot topic at the moment. 
But piracy doesn't really affect the island of Cyprus, not directly. You haven't got fleets of pirate ships sitting off of, uh, of Cyprus, going on board ships, uh, going in and out of Cyprus. It doesn't happen. In the eastern Mediterranean, there is really not a problem with piracy. However, for the shipping companies operating out of Cyprus, there is a huge problem with piracy. And they are sending ships down through Suez and across um, the Arabian Sea, which is one of the hotbeds of piracy. But it's not the only place, that's the one that's in the news at the moment. But don't forget, actually there's some very serious piracy going on in the Gulf of Guinea, around Nigeria and that area, again, where a lot of shipping companies from Cyprus send their ships. There is a lot of piracy still in the Malacca Strait. There is also a lot of piracy in the Amazon Basin. So piracy is worldwide, and shipping companies operate worldwide. Cy Cyprus has just actually enacted some anti-piracy legislation. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but I have copies of it uh, in here, and it's about 16 pages. So I don't intend to go through all of that now. But basically what it does, it allows Cypriot flagships to be able to defend themselves against pirates. So it is an issue, but it's not an issue that immediately affects the actual island of Cyprus. So I don't intend to dwell on piracy. What actually is affecting the island of Cyprus hugely, and has been briefly mentioned earlier, is human trafficking. Now human trafficking happens for all sorts of reasons, and um, all of those on there have happened. This is not just Cyprus, this is a worldwide problem now. So not everything that is listed there is actually happening in Cyprus. But throughout the world, this is a massive problem. And it's now, for criminals, the second biggest money earner after illegal narcotics. And they make an awful lot of money out of it. And this is a, this is a specialist subject. I could spend a whole day just talking about human trafficking, and it's something that I've been very involved in during my police career and to a certain extent when I was in the, in the Royal Navy. But we know that it's happening uh, in Cyprus. We know there are people who are brought in there illegally and some of them are brought in to do illegal things like work in the uh, sex industry, um, but also in other, other areas as well. So the only way these people get into Cyprus because the last time I looked, there was no road bridge going out of Cyprus uh, to, any, uh, to any, anywhere east, north, south or west. They can't come in by air very easily because they're checked as they're coming through the airport. The way people are coming into Cyprus is by sea. And it's a huge coastline which can't be patrolled the whole time. And again, I'll come on to that a little bit more later. I won't dwell on this. All I will say is that uh, Human traffickers, in my experience, and I've dealt with quite a few of them, are particularly evil people with no morals and no consideration for human life. Another big issue that we have, and again this is affecting Cyprus, drugs, gun and money laundering. Money laundering has been a big one uh, lately with what's happened uh, with the euro price, etc. So I don't intend to dwell on that. But again, narcotics and the guns, the illegal guns, uh, that come into Cyprus, again, are coming in predominantly by sea. I accept some will come in through the airports, but the vast majority have got to come in um, by sea where they cannot be intercepted so easily. It leads to big money. As, uh, as you know, drugs is a huge business. And where you get drugs, you're going to get dirty money, and there's the money laundry, com money laundry comes into it. And again, the money is shifted around, and quite often, again, is shifted by sea. Maritime terrorism. Not seen as a major threat in Cyprus, apart from possibly in the sovereign base areas. But maritime terrorism does exist, and uh, we have, have had examples of it. Now, what worries me, having heard the lectures earlier, is the possibility of building this big LNG battery ship and sitting it off of Cyprus. For me, if I was a terrorist, I'd simply say, bloody good oh, what a target. And that's something that's going to have to be thought about very, very seriously now. So terrorism may not be considered, or maritime terrorism, sorry, may not be considered that much of a threat in Cyprus at the moment, but I suggest to you, as we now go forward with uh, extracting uh, the natural gas from the waters around Cyprus, it's going to be a threat, and it's something 
and especially that Cyprus has now gone hand in hand with Israel on this, and there is no doubt in the world that most of the lunatic terrorist organisations in the world would like nothing better than to have a major hit on Israel. And if Cyprus is now going to be as closely partnered with Israel as seems to be the case from what I've heard this afternoon, then I think you've got a big problem developing here, and this is going to need to be looked at very, very seriously. Okay, this was the uh, attack on the, uh, the Lindbergh, uh, which actually happened in... Uh, oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. The Lindbergh happened in the Arabian Gulf, but the MV Achille Laro happened in the Mediterranean, not that far away from Cyprus, although that's a good few years ago. But just, just, to let, just to show you there a couple of examples of maritime terrorism. Okay, the maritime leisure industry, and we had a very good talk on the cruise liners uh, earlier. This is fast developing. It is a massive industry already, and again, is an ideal place for a terrorist target. It's also an ideal place to commit criminal offences and to operate criminal enterprises. A cruise ship is basically a small city at sea with all the facilities that go with a small city. And on board that ship, you're going to have people who are going to engage in maritime crime, or in crime generally. And there's all sorts of, uh, again, I could spend ages talking about this, but just to give you the flavour for it, they are, they are, as I say, small cities. And with that, you're going to get uh, uh, illegal sex trade operating on board, for one example. You're going to get illegal drugs being sold on board. You can get, although there is gambling on board that's done illegally, there could be illegal gambling. And as I say, again, possible target for terrorism. The other thing with maritime leisure industry, anybody can go out and buy themselves a craft. Anything from a small sailing dinghy to a big multi-millionaire super yacht. And you don't need to have any qualifications to be able to do that. You can't drive a car on the road without a driving licence. You certainly can't fly a light aircraft without a pilot's licence, but you can take any craft to sea just about anywhere in the world now without any, any form of maritime qualification. And this leads to problems because people who do this don't understand the laws of the sea and therefore by definition will break the law without necessarily realising they're doing it. And again, this can lead to security issues. It's very difficult to enforce the law on the water because you've got to get the You've got to catch the people, and when you've got hundreds and hundreds of sailing boats rolling around in the, you know, just people out enjoying themselves on a Saturday afternoon or whatever, it's very difficult to interdict them and check that the people know what they're doing. I've put jet skis on there as one particular one because, to me, jet skis are a lethal weapon. During my period of uh, policing in Cyprus, I dealt with several deaths caused by jet skis, and again, this is because people can just go and buy a jet ski and take it out and they don't know how to operate it, they don't realise how dangerous it is, and picking the 16-year-old young girl dead out of the water who happens to be the daughter of a friend of mine is not a particularly great way of uh, spending your day. And again, this is a problem. Other potential maritime security issues, well, the good old-fashioned contraband hasn't gone away. People still smuggle cigarettes and alcohol and various other goods that uh, they don't want to pay tax on. It's still happening. Illegal fishing uh, goes on throughout the world. And again, it goes on in Cyprus for certain. One of the uh, criminals that I was chasing for most of my time in Cyprus that I never actually caught, regrettably, was a guy who was fishing with dynamite. Now, not only is that breaking the law, that's also extremely dangerous. But uh, he used to go out and he used to throw sticks of dynamite in the water and the fish would come up, he'd scoop them up and off he'd go. Illegal exploitation of the seabed. Now, we'll come back again to the uh, natural gas. This could be a big issue here with criminal enterprise and trying to get involved in this. But also, as I've said earlier, it's going to be a massive security issue for protecting uh, these installations and other normal criminal activities using the sea as a means of transport supply. In this country, uh, very expensive motor cars get stolen to order, they're loaded into containers, and these containers are quite innocently put on container ships. Captain of the ship doesn't know that he's actually smuggling or transporting stolen goods. 
That's just one example, but there's lots of others. So again, ships can be used uh, to commit crimes without the crew, without the owners knowing anything about it. Again, it is happening. And containers uh, for use in any sort of criminal enterprise at sea are a marvellous way of doing it. And I was involved in a container study some years ago, and the figures are actually quite staggering. It's another issue I could spend all afternoon talking to you about, but I'm very aware of the time, so we need to keep moving. Um, all of these, I think, will cause problems for maritime security in Cyprus, and they need to be addressed. I think they're all fairly straightforward. Um, Schengen, the open border policy, again, that's going to be, I think, something that's going to have to be looked at very carefully. Currently still on hold because of the problems with not having resolved the, uh, the Cyprus problem, and that may go out further than 2016 yet. The last I looked, they're hoping to uh, Cyprus to sign up to it by then. Possible ways of uh, a maritime uh, security strategy? Partnership approach, as I said. The island has three distinct communities. Those three communities need to link up in a partnership approach, but not just them, but other partners, the various agencies that have something to do with the sea, the police marine units, the customs, the coast guard, etc., etc. The ISPS code, I'm sure everyone here is aware of the ISPS code. We need to build upon that. Um, it's actually been more successful, I think, than most people thought it was going to be. And it's just been revised again recently, but it's there and it has to be obeyed. Um, we have a thing in this country called the Multi-Agency Threat and Risk Assessment, uh, MATRA, which is a, a national committee with all the different agencies sitting down together to discuss the problems with maritime security. Uh, certainly need to improve port security, although that's happened, I think, with the ISPS code. And we need to use proven good practice. Op Kraken is something that started in the United Kingdom. Hampshire Marine Police introduced this. And it's basically getting citizens to be on the lookout for strange things happening in the maritime environment and reporting it to the authorities. That now has rolled out nationally across the United Kingdom, and I would recommend it as something for Cyprus. Again, in this country, we've established regional maritime information intelligence teams, REMRITs, they sort of fall out of the matric process. From then, we've uh, established national portal operations and national portal contingency plans in case there is a security uh, incident, and so we know what we're doing when we deal with it. And from that, we would set up a joint operations command and control structure, which needs supportive management, and all of this can be done so much better with the security on the water if we have proper marine policing. And in this country, we don't, unfortunately. We're an island as well as in the, as well in the United Kingdom, and our, I have to say I haven't been involved in it for a long time now. Our marine policing is not what it should be. In Cyprus, certainly in the sovereign base areas and within the, uh, the Republic, there is good marine policing. The North, not quite so good at the moment. But by the use of a viable marine presence, it will help with the security, it will act as a deterrent. And once again, that's me, played into the helicopter there. We didn't realize at the time that photograph was being taken, because if we had, we never have got the formation so good. <laughs> but the, the others in there are all, uh, are all Cypriots, um, who were my team that uh, I used to have the pleasure and privilege of being in command of. Okay, so Marine Police still need to do a lot of things. All of this is starting to happen, um, certainly as I say in Cyprus, and I think it would be a good idea across the island if you thought about introducing Op Kraken. So my final thoughts, you'll be glad to know. Um, maritime security is a big issue facing Cyprus. Cyprus is an island, it's a maritime nation, and so maritime security has got to be properly addressed. I say sea blindness is a factor. Although Cyprus is an island and no one lives 30 miles from the sea, not everybody knows about the sea. A lot of people just completely ignore it. As far as they're concerned, it's that sort of wet, crinkly stuff in the distance when it's a nice day, they might go and splash around in it occasionally, but they don't think about how important it is to, uh, to the island. Bear in mind, a lot, of, uh, a lot of trade for Cyprus comes in by the sea. 
We need to get politicians and public made aware of this, get them on side, and all you good people here when you go away after today, hopefully you're going to be doing some of that stuff. And that is what I say there, you need to spread the word. And a final thought for you, to quote Oliver Wendell Holmes, we can't sit still with this, we, maritime security, we've got to keep moving, we've got to keep up to date with it, we've got to be aware of what's going on in the maritime environment and be prepared to deal with it. And finally, I know questions are going to come as a, in the forum here, but you'll be delighted to know, with the exception of that funny bloke in the middle there, all the rest of those officers are still on patrol in the seas off Cyprus, even today, as we're stood here talking. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Neil.